they will go through some regional prophecies uh, who talk Vyacheslav and few other sources which will not cover all the parts of the world for sure but as he said um, they are kind of examples illustrating how the experience of the people in different regions uh, will be actually very very different during the end times in a way and then in the next uh, one or two episodes i will switch back to dynamics of the events like for example the first episode was and then in the last Vyacheslav uh, episode uh, there will be notes about his personal life because uh, he is gone uh, but his mother is here and uh, that will play a big role and after the regional prophecies uh, we'll see a few questions like this one which I think are very important and um, then the prayer uh, for protection against uh, abduction by evil spirits or aliens or against those uh, creatures, worms and dinosaurs which according to Vyacheslav will be crawling out uh, from the underworld in a couple of years. It is a prayer uh, for protection from all the members of the parasitic family. And then <clears throat> in the next appendix uh, will be about how to attempt to make holy water yourself because Utrok Vyacheslav uh, regularly urged us to bury supplies of water as much as possible uh, because the water will disappear completely and then uh, he always also recommended that the best will be to uh, bury holy water because it stays good longer at least 40 years or forever and i was wondering well how to procure that the church doesn't seem to be the place to get it anymore probably the priest is already marked with the mark of the beast and, and the paraphernalia and the items around many of them probably have a kind of hidden satanic symbols so i'm not sure how holy will be that holy water so i may have some solution for that It will be a lovely sunny day in the Baltic regions. The raiders will not register earthquake or anything at all out of the ordinary. And all of a sudden, without any warning at all, 30 meters high wave will come from the sea and sweep up everything. After the wave, there will be no debris at all. There will be only sand. The city of Vladivostok again the coastal region will be destroyed in the very same way only one antique street light post will stick out of uh, the fields of fine sand and Vyacheslav said that these are just two random examples of the fate of many coastal regions during the tribulation Saint Patrick the patron saint of Ireland, he, along with uh, some other local saints, uh, he left predictions confirming this and uh, saying that uh, Ireland will be wiped out completely by a single enormous wave and that will happen seven years before the last day. Uh, the last day uh, is just another expression for the judgment day as far as I understand. St. Patrick uh, saw that as a great blessing for the Irish nation because that will save them uh, from seeing the bloody reign of the Antichrist. And since the Irish prophecy seems to come from a number of uh, old sources, that's why I have included it uh, here uh, in the chart as one of the signs that the, the tribulation begins. When Nina spoke of the sinking of Japan, uh, she also mentioned that it will be kind of the beginning, in, in the beginning of the ordeal, so maybe it's uh, kind of correlated, uh, the fate of uh, the coastal regions. The devils, the parasites, they will also poison a huge lake of uh, drinking water in Iraq. They will organize an oil spill, uh, 
crude oil in large quantities and that will be an enormous ecological catastrophe it will just poison everything around so people will be trying uh, to desperately clean up and eventually and they will manage to uh, clean up the oil uh, but the water uh, will remain poisoned they will have no solution for that and uh, this will be a big problem for that uh, dry and hot region so what will happen then Otrok Vyacheslav explained this uh, that uh, by this point of time his remains would be in Moscow it seems uh, his identity will be also properly uh, revealed by an, a very old book that they will find so he will be uh, way more famous than uh, he is now and uh, then after this uh, ecological catastrophe when the water is poisoned they will uh, take his remains with a plane and uh, put him on the shore of the lake and he will help in this situation he will help unlike uh, the situation with uh, the giant fault in China where they will also take him but he will not be able to help because it will not be the will of the Lord as far as uh, Israel he mentioned very shortly whatever we already know from the Bible and that uh, all the Arabs will rise against them and besiege them from all sides the Israelis will fight uh, uh, very bravely uh, but uh, as we know from the Bible they will lose I'm not sure is that episode before or after the coronation uh, moreover the biblical and the Arabic sources suggest a number of wars in those regions so it's not uh, sure which one is Vyacheslav talking about As far as America, as I mentioned earlier, he said that uh, first they will blow two tall towers, then a bridge, and then the Statue of Liberty. The same party uh, who are uh, organizing everything, he mentions them quite explicitly, I use more like a, a general name. So I'm not sure if the episode uh, with the bridge has already happened, because uh, he explained that uh, Initially, people will doubt that it is a man-made disaster, but then they will decide that the bridge collapsed itself. There was there maybe something like this happening already or not, I'm not sure. Uh, but the Statue of Liberty will be the last, and uh, when they blow that up, it will kind of start moving from the explosion, and uh, only then it will collapse. And there will be no attempt to rebuild it or anything. And also I believe uh, Vyacheslav mentioned that at a later stage the United States will no longer be united, the individual states uh, will uh, start existing on their own, which is also there in a number of uh, other prophecies as well, which we already covered. Now, as far as the fate of the Caucasus region, of the Caucasus mountains, Vyacheslav said that uh, after I depart, an endless war will start and uh, where I will be buried, he said, uh, there will be the graves of many young soldiers who will die in those wars and that's exactly how it happened um, because uh, the father of uh, Vyacheslav, he had a minor rank in the military so they lived in a, um, a town devoted uh, to the military in the Ural regions of Russia. And later on, uh, during the apocalypse, uh, Vyacheslav said, the Caucasus region uh, will be partially submerged uh, by giant mud flood. And because at that time it will be very hot and dry, this mud will solidify very fast and it will become very hard the layer will be very thick uh, so basically the hills and the mountains they will uh, stick out like islands with a bit of vegetation sticking out from the desert of petrified mud and speaking about the Caucasus uh, region there was a prominent saint canonized there uh, Gavril Urgibadze
he must be a reliable source uh, because uh, even while he was alive uh, many healing uh, miracles took place so as far as uh, the future uh, during the apocalyptic times of his country georgia he said that uh, as everywhere else the unmarked people will be uh, prosecuted but to lesser extent it will be milder over there in Georgia, not as bad as Russia, for example. And back then, some 30-40 years ago, uh, he was telling the younger monks and nuns, you will live uh, until the time of the Antichrist, you will see him. He described the people uh, which he saw in our times as uh, uh, women becoming like men and men like women in terms of... Uh, the hairstyle and the clothes they wear. Eventually the zombie fight will start uh, uh, wander naked. I don't know, did he mean completely naked or like swimming suit uh, style naked, which is uh, also pretty naked for uh, the standards of a monk. But then he said the noble people, they will uh, continue wearing normal clothes and um, Sometimes people will be chased uh, by the zombies, by the marked people, just for wearing normal clothes. That's how they will uh, recognize the normal people. He also saw uh, people being implanted on the index finger. And as Utrok Vyacheslav warned uh, that uh, bamboozling the confused uh, crowd with talk and Holographic images of uh, aliens will be a major way to mark them. He said that they will be uh, showing all kinds of sights to behold in the skies, but it will be all fake. It will be all staged uh, to defraud the people and at the end uh, mark them under all kinds of uh, pretext after showing them spectacular images. And this, he said, uh, will be going on big time. While he was still alive, uh, uh, he said now there are still uh, wise monks uh, who will uh, help you and guide you and who will answer uh, your questions with the truth. But when the apocalypse comes, before its very beginning, God will withdraw many of his best people and there will be almost nobody to take refuge in, to take advice from. By the way, did you know that in the Vatican they had even a conference, a big meeting already discussing, inviting, getting ready for the aliens? And after the meeting they came up with all these public statements that uh, we are ready to meet them and uh, well, maybe baptize them or maybe we learn from them and there were even statements, maybe the aliens will clear for us the blurry places in the Bible. Oh, how eagerly they will on the blur everything for uh, such uh, deluded people. And all that uh, you can conduct uh, online, of course, permanently move your church online so that they can track every word easier. Once Utrok Vyacheslav's mother was reading the Bible and there was a verse saying and the sea burned and together with it the sky burned and after that the land was different and there was no sea and the sky was different and she wondered what is this all about, where is this sea and she asked him and he said this is the Black Sea uh, mother it will burn because uh, the seas now we see water but this is actually a very very thin layer on the top um, deep there at great depth actually these uh, worms live and that layer is much thicker than the water layer and these worms the deeper you go the more giant uh, they get 
on the bottom of the Black Sea, you, you get only small worms, like uh, smaller cousins, and that's why the water is very, very uh, murky and uh, unclean in that sea, because of the waste of uh, all these worms. So, because of the waste of this, uh, uh, discharged by these worms, uh, who have been living there for a very, very long time, there is a kind of a bubble below the sea of hydrogen sulfate, which is highly flammable. And this is a disaster waiting to happen. And when the spark of the apocalypse uh, breaks this bubble free and ignites the entire thing, really, he said, as the Bible says, the sea will burn and even the sky will burn. First, there will be one big explosion, uh, very big, that will uh, literally sh shatter the regions around the sea. Part of the coastal regions will be destroyed. Uh, maybe in Turkey, his mother doesn't remember very well. And there will be subsequent uh, uh, explosions while this uh, gas uh, gets uh, loose more and more from the bubble, it will burn, but those uh, secondary explosions will be smaller. And there is a big Russian city called uh, Odessa on uh, the shores of the Black Sea, and he said that um, still many people will be saved even in that city, because um, what will happen is uh, because of the explosion, a large uh, pipe under pressure with uh, drinking water from the municipality, it will uh, crack in such a way that it will form a kind of a fountain. And that fountain, that uh, stream of water, which will be huge, because the pipe will be very big, it will kind of uh, clear a little bit of the uh, toxins so that some people in Odessa can be saved. Once Vyacheslav's mother asked him, why uh, I hear you talk to people uh, more often about hell and you describe uh, how the souls suffer there and I hear very little from you about how heaven is. Sometimes you say things, but it is not much. Vyacheslav replied uh, that uh, the current people, as they are now, they are not uh, yet developed to understand heaven anyway. But hell, uh, I tell them often about that, so that at least maybe some of them will get shocked and will decide not to take the path leading to that place. Vyacheslav's mother uh, read that uh, during the time of the Antichrist, even many good people will be defrauded by his tricks and will take his mark, although in nature, in heart, they are actually good. Vyacheslav replied uh, that, uh, yes, there will be many such good people. And uh, what will happen to them is that uh, for them the integration uh, will be way more difficult. Because those who already have uh, demonic qualities developed in their personality, everything will, as modern people say, resonate with the lifestyle uh, suggested by the Antichrist anyway. So for them there won't be that much of a drastic difference, you know, alcoholism, debauchery, mm -hmm. how they call it, binge drinking, uh, this type of lifestyle. 
But as far as the good people, because uh, when the mark, the zombies, when they turn into cyborgs, they will still uh, keep their memory from the times they were human. So for the zombies who were uh, good people before, they will have a very hard time adjusting because that will not be their nature. And their memories of the times when they were human will torment them very, very much. So such people uh, will go through a period of um, a very deep emotional distress uh, before they eventually integrate into the uh, devilish cyborg uh, society and community. But they will eventually integrate because uh, everybody who gets the mark uh, surely will. They, there is no atonement, there is no uh, surgical removal, there is no purification, there is no detoxication, detoxification uh, from that. And um, uh, they will be involved in all those uh, atrocities and disgusting stuff because they will be dictated order to do so by the main server uh, which manages them as uh, half humans uh, half machines in other words uh, cyborgs there will be no forgiveness for anybody who has taken the mark Vyacheslav confirmed again and again Here, in the prophecies I published last year, it was there that they will start uh, drafting women compulsory in many countries, and it is already beginning. Yes, indeed, uh, black magic is absolutely condemned by God. But yet, if you uh, read the Bible and the Quran uh, in terms of how our world and existence function, you will find out that, uh, according to them, we really live in magical reality uh, created by God, by His Word. Also in the Vedas, uh, in the beginning was Shabda Brahma, this um, magical sound uh, subtle sound uh, from which uh, eventually Lord manifested our entire ex existence together with the worlds, heavens, hells. And in the Bible, again, they say in the beginning it was the word of the Lord. Shabda Brahma is called uh, the word, or in more common language, benevolent magical spell, white magic. Partially, this uh, predicament into which you ended is because in the Middle Ages, they ca kind of um, demonized the word magic by uh, putting it into the meaning of only black magic. That's a part of their plan of how to use the church to confuse the people instead of educating them and um, even in the Bible, I don't know the story very well, but uh, was it Jesus who explained that uh, if you understand and believe in your true self, you will be able to make all these uh, things which you call miracles that I make. And um, uh, they, they started also walking in, on water like him, but later on they couldn't believe their eyes and uh, started sinking, something of that sort. I'm not a Bible expert. But what I try to illustrate is uh, why in the church and probably in Islam as well, until date, uh, there are lots of uh, controversies where exactly godly miracle ends and where black magic starts. And uh, this type of controversies, they will never find their true answer 
in this uh, current church paradigm, which is so simplified into black and white, uh, that they don't even register that in the real world uh, there is an entire spectrum of wonderful colors which are different from white and black. And even in this uh, white and black reality into which uh, they try to put the believers in, even in that they cannot uh, find the answer because um, the godly miracles in the Church of Ice, they look, well, magical and they have already demonized that word. So, to speak in practical words, sometimes uh, Christian saints, they would put, uh, they call it prayer in herbs and in this way heal people and then uh, their uh, fellow, whatever, bishops will accuse them of, uh, you see, you're putting spells. I mean, w where is uh, the clearly stated by God boundary between putting a prayer on a herb and uh, putting a spell? Actually, a prayer is a spell, that is the mantra. So, once you personally decide to go beyond definition and see the true nature of things, then you will be less perplexed. It's irrelevant uh, how you will decide to define magic. The important is to understand the essence of things. Now, let's see your exact question. Why do I mention civilizations which used magical practices set, I think you uh, mean the set books of Jane Roberts. Well, actually, if you start reading those books, you will see for yourself that uh, set doesn't recommend any magical, according to biblical definition, which I assume is your definition, practice at all. All he talks about is uh, changing in what you believe, exactly as it is recommended in the Bible. 100% exactly. So, the actual question here is, who misled you uh, to think that Set recommends magical practices, although probably you have not even read the material? And, I mean, think for yourself. This must be the source which has led you to think in that way. It must be very superficial. Will you trust that source in important times for your soul as the apocalyptic? Or it will be better to start sorting out the things for yourself. Now, the other one is very interesting. Why do I mention the Egyptians uh, when they were full of black magic? They were, really, some of them, uh, literally, by all definitions. Well, for I mentioned them for the same reason that they are mentioned again and again in the Bible, to give bad example. <laughs> I have very good reasons to believe that I myself uh, had a birth in uh, really ancient Egypt and I went uh, big time wrong exactly in that particular birth and I've been mentioning it a number of times in the previous videos just to bring this message, don't do that uh, because after those mistakes that ruined uh, dozens of lives for me three of them in a row in hell three times reborn there, as far as I understand uh, exactly for the mistakes uh, made in Egypt. So why do I mention it? To warn you not to do the same mistake and to confirm from my personal experience what uh, Vyacheslav uh, came to tell you, uh, why he died in such a way, just uh, he, he died so that he is able to tell you all this, that God will forgive nobody who takes the mark. However, the situation with uh, ancient and allegedly ancient Egypt is uh, not that simple at all. First of all, most of uh, what we call ancient Egypt is actually post-Christ Egypt. That's why they have the Ankh symbol, the cross. That is nothing else but a Christian cross. That is uh, what, what seems to transpire from the artifacts. You can see my previous uh, videos on Egypt and uh, mostly the research of uh, uh, the new chronology project by Anatoly Fomenko. Uh, plenty of evidence over there. So why do I mention all this? Well, to bring the truth out there. Because you seem to come from like biblical background, but to understand the Bible properly, you need at least a basic historic orientation and uh, in school you got historic disorientation. So I think uh, Egypt is uh, well worth mentioning 
And the really, really big megaliths like the pyramids, uh, probably the Osirian, I do believe that uh, those were uh, pre-Christ era uh, buildings. And there are many more of them. That's why in Egypt uh, they're so fanatical about uh, preventing people from uh, digging the ground in any way even to bury their disease, because uh, they don't want to bring the old big uh, uh, megaliths in public view, because that will reveal some of the true history and will cast the shadow of uh, doubt even on uh, uh, biblical interpretations of what is condemned by God and when and why. Because uh, it seems there was a time of big-time betrayal in Egypt. There are few sources about it. But as the story goes, uh, Egypt was a relatively uh, pure uh, place of uh, godly magic. I, I don't know how you call that, but uh, maybe a place where people revert the benevolent godfather. And after that... Uh, the betrayal took place. And also, as far as I understand, the society somehow uh, eventually managed by itself uh, within to overthrow these usurpators. And also what I find very sad is that uh, many Christian people are very confused about uh, Hinduism. They think uh, it's a place of uh, many gods. But in Hinduism, uh, all these gods, they are aspects, they are qualities of what in Christianity uh, you people call Godfather. Uh, that is the Brahman and Shiva, Devi, uh, Vishnu. These are all manifestations of this Brahman. That's why they have the status of Bhagavan, uh, manifestation of the Lord. But the original Lord is one. There aren't multiple gods. The male forms are called uh, Bhagavan and the females Bhagavati, that is just the feminine form. But they are one and the same soul. This is uh, accepted pretty much by all um, Hindu schools, which are numerous. Actually, there is no religion like Hinduism. There is no central governing body. Uh, they are multiple, there, there is a plethora of philosophies, but about uh, Bhagavan and one single Brahman, that, that is something which is pretty much accepted by everybody. Uh, yes, there are different lords in Hinduism, exactly like uh, here we have lords of different uh, area, even here we have a graph in the village, uh, his whatever grand-grandfather was a real graph of a big chunk of uh, Europe, this doesn't mean that his uh, grandfather was one of the gods in heaven. He was a lord. So this is how the parasites uh, use uh, this, uh, the double meaning of words to confuse people and divide and conquer, make them quarrel with each other. Um, like in Hinduism, there is the lord uh, of the wind, Vayu, he is uh, really a regional lord who worships Bhagavan. He does. He is not in the illusion himself that he is the lord. And in the Bible, what they say: don't uh, don't worship um, idols. Look in the sky, and that will be your lord. Does it mean that the sky is? Uh, what to say, the only Godfather or one of the Lords, or also Jesus appeared in different visions to various saints. So these were like different visions. Does it mean that uh, in Christianity you have many gods? No, it doesn't. Then why do you call the different visions in Hinduism uh, different Lords? You call it because uh, you were misled by the school teacher, by you are being misled every day by the mass media. All this is uh, divide and conquer. Not only the figure of the Godfather matches perfectly across uh, all major religions, actually. But now, talking about the uh, comparison of Hinduism and Christianity, the Holy Trinity is uh, fully present in Hinduism. God the Father uh, is the Brahman, the original and one and only God. 
Paramatma is the Holy Spirit because uh, in Christianity it is described as a, a feature of the Lord which is present in the heart of each and every living being and that's exactly how Paramatma is described in the Vedas. But still, uh, most uh, Christians are convinced that uh, Hinduism uh, will be a civilization uh, with magical practices condemned by the Lord. And why do they believe that? Because they have heard it from the other Christians who just repeat uh, what they have heard without understanding and without studying the things. Uh, that's what it is all about. So the reason of the entire ambiguity you mentioned is that, for example, Christians they just uh, repeat what they have heard from the TV uh, without checking themselves the old uh, sources of the other religions, that's all. Other ways uh, in which they uh, make people quarrel with no reasons is, uh, they say, uh, look at Durga with all her weapons and she's got a skull uh, garland around her neck how cruel and compared to the pure and white Jesus Christ. All these uh, skulls that uh, she is wearing, these are trophies, these are the heads of the head parasites uh, which she uh, killed by the request of the noble people in the previous worlds because our earth is actually quite young. Before that there were previous earths, previous phases and uh, people were facing uh, similar problems and every time an incarnation of the Lord came and uh, cleaned up the parasites. And if you go uh, to a Christian church and see the angels uh, depicted there, you will see them with all kinds of spears and rather sharp weapons. Believe me, that is for killing. For killing what? Again, parasites. That, that is the same thing. And uh, this is an important, I think, uh, question. She's asking why exactly uh, do the parasites organize these uh, wildfires? Why exactly are they dispersing these uh, flammable gases in the skies? Are they recreating the prophecies? She's asking. It is quite possible. I don't know what is going in their sick minds. But they could be using the prophecies for their scenario as well, because uh, they know the end is near. And uh, the only thing that matters for them now is to harvest as many souls as possible. And according to the biblical scenario, they will harvest uh, almost everybody. So they could be recreating or not. Uh, the important thing is to understand that um, all these demonic entities, they cannot do anything constructive and at the end, they will perish together with their evil schemes. These entities are tamasic and one of the prominent qualities of uh, tamaguna is uh, self-destruction at the end. Whatever they do, this will be the end, there will be no other end for them and for their environment. For example, in the Hermetic prophecies, the Lament of Hermes, they were described like this. They will find death more profitable than life. Now, the way you have typed in the question shows that uh, you have invested uh, some time in uh, thinking why exactly would they be um, provoking these fires. These people are obviously out of their minds, plus uh, it's not a single group, it's different gangs who do not have a single opinion. Only God knows what uh, goes in the cumulative uh, sick mental space of these gangs. But I would like, why I think this question is uh, very important is, I would like to point uh, something related to this, the cause of these fires, which is kind of out of your scope. And at the same time, uh, it is affecting you uh, much more personally than any of the listed reasons which uh, came to your mind. Mary Julie Chehenny described this problem as this. There will be a type of people who will want to learn all the details of all the scams of the devils. They will waste all their time because uh, the amount of lunatic 
ideas which the devils generate is endless until they leave they will not do anything except nonsense so it is anyway impossible to figure out uh, which exactly path of self-destruction uh, will they select for suicide but while one swims in that swamp one will surely lose one's soul and Utrok Vyacheslav also spoke about this thing that the people who feel that it is necessary to have a complete understanding of all the madness around they will all take the mark because their entire energy will, do, will be invested in finding out those details if we speak in penguinian scientific terms it's this uh, phenomena that uh, monkey see monkey do if one tries to understand too much detail of the lunacy of the parasites in human forms one will be too much exposed to their symbol and behavior patterns while informing oneself uh, what is actually going on one may consciously condemn the parasites however the way the subconscious mind works and this is proven by countless experiments it's a basics of psychology is uh, whatever we see whatever we perceive on subconscious level it is there in our files as a possible behavior pattern and uh, we know that so many things so many decisions we take up subconsciously and when we have uh, too many parasitic uh, patterns on the file and because of uh, overexposure to alternative media which is mostly wolves in sheep skin one will become like that monkey see monkey do and uh, one will be eventually tricked into believing that this is a way uh, a reality a, a way to deal with life and it's too difficult and well let's make a small compromise and take the mark and since years uh, i've been talking about this phenomena in uh, future tense but now i see it happening uh, because i connect with many people especially the people who are very much into understanding every detail they are very persistent some of them to contact me and necessarily speak to me about all and every detail and now i i checked just to get sure am i on the right track yes all these people uh, are already have some of them have accepted the mark and the others are let's see which means they will also accept it the attitude in this regard of the simple-hearted religious people who will just wave their hand and say oh all these are uh, just devilish things we don't need that you know some of them even cover their ears when uh, people try to talk about the devilish initiatives uh, they think it's contaminating to even hear about such things these people are on the right track in uh, this situation and they will also have uh, enough personal time to purify uh, their own soul uh, because uh, this type of research into each and every uh, detail of the parasitic lunacy that takes a lot of energy uh, one is so much distracted by the external noise that uh, people who concentrate too much on that basically they do not have time or even desire to look inside if they try to do that they feel lonely so in other words to summarize we are forced to see lots of details of the parasitic lunacy and we will find out lots of details just by living on earth there is no other way but when it becomes an obsession to find each and every detail this is something else This is a sh short orthodox prayer recommended by Utrok Vyacheslav uh, himself for uh, chasing away parasites. Now, before the non-religious people close the video, please wait a few seconds. I think uh, the prayer may work with the uh, more ancient uh, forms of the cross, which uh, you see now on the screen. I understand that uh, the church cross may have um, somewhat repulsive effect for some people uh, because the church is 
not, not so holy all of the church at least nowadays and we don't want that negativity to reflect on our prayer that's why even using it with a non-church cross it should work as well uh, for example i myself uh, inspired by otro Vyacheslav, i made my uh, own cross i made the cast uh, with uh, epoxy resin and the uh, corundum de rosa fire which i recommended uh, in previous videos and i used one of these uh, older forms of the cross um, to be more precise the the bogomil the guitar cross so how to use the prayer basically anytime you feel a demonic presence around in any form as ghost or as alien uh, Vyacheslav said that uh, the way usually these aliens enter into our reality is uh, they get uh, well prepared beforehand. You know, sometimes in the hospital they take up a minute portion of skin for testing, they say. Um, but actually they hand it over and just from a very minute amount of uh, human skin, they grow an entire human outfit and then... Um, the, the demon enters inside and then he moves around us and we don't recognize them so the parasites they come in all kinds of forms or if uh, their human friends are troubling you and you need immediate help this is a short prayer um, which can give immediate results uh, by the way Alexander Pramonov who mentions the order of the hospitalier knights um, he also published this emblem of this order and as you can see their cross is also symmetrical I explained why in uh, previous episodes it's, uh, it, it seems to be a good idea to use a symmetrical cross so I myself use the Slavic text of the prayer but I also made an English translation about which uh, many people now will feel uh, well, this is a little bit too much for me N not, not my cup of tea but I hope you keep a copy of it uh, for later on because in the prophecy it says people will change when they find themselves uh, practically stranded at home at that time, uh, those who don't have any prayer text or any printed icon many of them will regret it now, uh, when we speak about protection prayers, which is the same as mantras or uh, spells, it's well known f from all uh, ancient cultures that one needs initiation into these things. Otherwise, the mantra may not work uh, so well. And the good thing is that uh, we have received this prayer exactly from Trok Vyacheslav, who is uh, one of the last prophets of our times, so we have received it directly from the pure source that's why i'm publishing it exactly in the form uh, in which he left it to us because uh, that is important and here i will uh, read it to you in original the воскресний бог и растучаться в рази его и добежат от лица его ненавидящие его як исчезает дым да исчезнут як утает воск от лица огня Так куда погибнут беси от лица любящих Бога и знаменующиеся крестным знаменем, и в веселье глаголющих радуйся, причесный животворящий крест Господень, прогоняя беса и силою на Тебе пропятого Господа нашего Иисуса Христа, Влад щедшего и поправшего сила дьяволю, и даровавшего нам Тебе крест свой честный на прогнание всякого супостата. О, почесный животворящий крест Господень, помогай мне со святой Госпожею, Девою Богородицею и со всеми святыми во веки. Амин. So, how exactly to remain protected by this symbol at all times? You will need to wear it on your body uh, every day, non-stop day and night without taking it off it can be small size and it can be any of these crosses whichever you prefer preferably it should be made uh, with uh, pure noble materials as we saw in earlier videos uh, use pure materials to get pure results 
and the strength with which it will protect you will be proportionate to your purity and the intensity with which uh, you charge it with this prayer continuously. Preferably, you could uh, draw or uh, somehow sculpture bigger cross for your uh, home and your altar. Or you can um, fashion an imaginary, subtle, etheric cross by just uh, imagining it. But then um, you need to regularly recharge it. Let's say, for example, you imagine a giant cross 20 meters long above your house, uh, like a canopy of protection. You can imagine that uh, one day and recharge it uh, with the prayer a few times, but then it is good to return again and again to the same image. That's how it will kind of solidify in the reality more and more. Because the cross will protect only unmarked people, because uh, if you accept uh, the mark in any form, uh, you go in the enemy category, so it's not sure what will be the result. If you uh, seek protection from it, and yet uh, you have joined the camp of the enemies. And same is true uh, with the ritual, which I'm going to recommend now for making holy water, because Utorok Vyacheslav recommended uh, repeatedly to bury supplies of water, and especially, if possible, holy water, and uh, the more the better. Well, easier said than done, because uh, when I read what, what is the meaning of holy water, I mean, very few people have access to that nowadays, uh, because uh, most likely the priest who will uh, offer you something like that is already marked, and the paraphernalia in the church has already uh, lots of satanic symbols, so I'm not sure if that holy water is really holy. And that's why I thought um, of... Um, a ritual uh, recommended in the Vedas uh, for a kind of offering water or food or actually any pure thing to the Lord. And um, the ritual is the, the form which I'm going to tell you about. I don't think it goes uh, against Christianity or even Islam. So, according to Vyacheslav, uh, clean drinking water as it comes from the springs, it's actually kind of a living matter, because it has been made like that by this uh, giant uh, skin-like purification entity or setup uh, below ground. And holy water, he explained, is uh, even superior than uh, living spring water, because... Um, it will stay alive and pure for much longer, he said, a minimum of 40 years. And if it is uh, uh, really genuine holy water, it will never go bad. So the ritual which I'm going to describe, with which um, everybody can attempt to make their holy water at home, uh, in the Hindu context it's called uh, Manas Puja. Because uh, traditionally, there are, of course, countless rituals in uh, Hinduism for everything. But there is this uh, Manas Puja, and that is recommended in cases uh, when one simply cannot um, get all these uh, uh, countless difficult-to-find-us ingredients which are needed for almost every uh, Vedic ritual. Simply means uh, mental worship. And the essence of this method is that um, you imagine all the ingredients uh, which you are lacking for the ritual. And if you perform it properly, the result will be the same, because uh, for the Lord, it doesn't matter if uh, the rose is uh, from our world or it's an etheric mental rose. He, he's got countless uh, roses, he can make even roses which we can't imagine. What matters is uh, our devotion. And uh, if there is enough of that uh, on our side invested in the ritual, there is a chance that the Lord will accept uh, our offering. 
So sincerity is uh, the main factor, but also since we are offering a water from our world, we have to adhere at least to some basic standards of uh, purity of that water. The best is to have spring water. If not possible, if uh, you have to use tap water, which is not a very good idea because uh, they use like uh, waste from hospitals, uh, you know, to make it and sometimes even uh, waters from containing sewage. And they say they purify that, uh, but uh, <laughs> actually it's not completely purified. If you are forced uh, by the circumstances uh, to use tap water, then at least um, get uh, a simple device for distilling water and that will be the closest to pure uh, living water that you can make at home. Now the amount of water which uh, you intend to offer to the Lord, you cannot uh, like smell it or taste it or try it or sample it in any way before uh, offering it to Him. I if you do that, or anybody else does that, that water isn't fit for offering. You, you should not attempt to offer it. And although there is no way that uh, the Western people uh, can manage with all the purity requirements, for example, of the vessels and the environment in which you try to offer water, still I think there is some minimum um, which, which we cannot lower, like for example, the vessels which you use, preferably, uh, they, they should not have been used for anybody to drink water from, let's say, the bottles that uh, the water is uh, placed in. It's okay if it is, let's say, some jug which uh, you sometimes uh, use in the kitchen to pour water from, but avoid vessels uh, that has been used directly for eating or drinking because... Uh, then I think there is very little chance for success in this uh, ritual. Brand new bottles from the shop, they are okay. But you should be careful not uh, to touch them with uh, dirty hands and dirty in Vedic uh, context is uh, way more complicated than uh, what we call dirty, for example. Well, basically, you, you better touch um, those bottles and vessels only after you wash your hands well with soap um, without touching anything else, because there are so many rules of what can be touched or not that it's uh, better just to uh, touch them only with washed hands. Uh, as much as you can, of course, uh, th that's uh, impossible to do really in the shop, but as much as you can. And then you have to select a suitable place for the ritual. A kitchen uh, with all kinds of alcohol around and uh, bloody pieces of meat, half cooked, that, that, that is uh, a place inviting evil spirits. Uh, um, the, the, the pure gods and the saints, they may not come to that ritual, they may not take the offering. The garden, if you have some uh, clean patch of grass uh, where people rarely go, it, it's probably better, but not like a pathway uh, that, that is also considered contaminated. So try to select a relatively uncontaminated room by Activities like drinking alcohol, eating meat, or watching TV. The more natural place, uh, the more, the higher the chances of success. And the surface on which you place the water, well, try as much as possible that uh, the surface is free from any of the contaminating elements I um, listed earlier. For example, if you have a brand new a piece of cloth from the shop, maybe you can uh, put that below the entire amount of water. And um, if you have like a large amount of water, you can open, let's say, one bottle for the ritual. And um, this is where the external preparations end. From now on, uh, the entire ritual will be on imaginary level only. To whom will you offer the water? I think uh, the most suitable deity for our times 
is Christ. After you offer it to Christ, you can also invite uh, saints, but you can't offer first to the saints and then to Christ. That you cannot do. So how exactly to offer it to Christ? Uh, of course, you have to concentrate and imagine him in whatever form is easier uh, for you. And then uh, maybe you can offer it as something that you can offer for him to drink. Or maybe you can imagine that uh, you in your, maybe let's say, angelic form with wings, you take a jug made out of precious stone and you wash his feet with that water. That is also a type of offering. And of course, in that environment, you should uh, place all that water in um, very beautiful crystal jugs or uh, jugs made out of precious stones or gold, such noble materials. And um, in whatever form you prefer, just uh, humbly offer it to the Lord for drinking or for washing his feet. And of course, uh, you have to do that uh, very respectfully with uh, whatever elements that involves according to your understanding and your culture. Because for Muslims, I think it will not be appropriate to select a human-like uh, avatar or manifestation of the Lord. Maybe that's against their rules. It doesn't have to be human-like uh, to be a ritual of somehow dedicating uh, the water to the Lord. And by the way, the same ritual can be used uh, to offer your food to the Lord. Uh, however, not everything we eat uh, will be eligible for offering. For example, meat, um, uh, onions, garlic, um, food that has been cooked more than uh, two hours ago. All these things uh, are not eligible. But for example, if you have like uh, clean fruits which uh, uh, have not been touched with uh, dirty hands and nobody has uh, uh, chewed on them, that can be offered or let's say uh, a, a container of yogurt because it's in a clean container already from the shop, that can be offered. And it is a very good practice to offer everything you eat or uh, drink uh, to the Lord first, if you can. And if um, you're in such a situation that uh, whatever you, you eat is not really offerable or the water doesn't comply to the requirements, then at least you should do what the uh, Christian people call blessing one's meal. It's not really an offering to the Lord in the sense that you are expecting him to also try it uh, before you eat it, but it's kind of uh, expressing gratitude towards the life-giving force of the Lord, uh, which uh, is so miraculous that has uh, created this entire existence around us of the nature, of the food, of our body, and everything else. It's, it's a, an expression of gratitude. And of course, if you happen to know some mantras or prayers, uh, this type of uh, rituals, they are the best time to use them. And that includes the prayer to the cross mentioned earlier as well.